who we are, um, and then we'll go into the, the main part of the, the uh, session. So we're going to go through the background of, of hydrocarbons, why we're using them. Some of that has obviously just been covered. Uh, we're going to look at where they're actually being used at the moment. We're going to talk about standards and regulations. So we're going to talk about the design side, how do we make sure hydrocarbon systems are safe, how much hydrocarbon can we use in systems. Um, and then we will look at safe handling briefly and a little bit about the training and qualifications. Uh, Steve and I run Core Concerns, so 100% of the business is here in Dublin at the moment. Um, we do a lot of work within the refrigeration, commercial refrigeration sector, uh, both training and consultancy. We're based in the UK, we travel all over the world, especially doing work related to hydrocarbon refrigerants, because it just so happens that what we're doing in the UK seems to be leading what's happening elsewhere on hydrocarbons. We're both refrigeration engineers. When we do training sessions, we're doing it as engineers, not as academics. So, on the hydrocarbon side, uh, we've been doing hydrocarbon training since about the mid-90s. Apparently I came over in about 1995 and did a session here that at least one person here was there, so that was good. Um, but we have trained thousands of engineers in the UK on hydrocarbons. Uh, we have also recently worked with City and Guilds on the development of their 6187 pathway unit on hydrocarbons, and we also do train the training sessions as well all over the world. And on a consultancy basis, we work with manufacturers of equipment to make sure that what they're designing and producing is safe to work with hydrocarbons. We do some of the simulated leak testing for them. And we also work with end users just to look at the overall application of hydrocarbons, for example, in the retail sector. We do lots of other things as well. Um, it's all practical. We worked on the Real Zero project, for example, on leakage reduction. We do work on energy efficiency. We do troubleshooting on site, that type of thing. And on the training, as well as hydrocarbon training, we do CO2 training, which is in the UK something that is fairly major at the moment because we've got several hundred supermarkets over in the UK running on CO2 as a refrigerant. We obviously do the F-gas training and various other things as well. Uh, we also do a lot of work directly with the industry. Um, Steve and I are both heavily involved in the Institute of Refrigeration in the UK. I'm past president. Steve chairs the service engineer section and also sits on the technical committee. We work with the British Refrigeration Association as well. For example, we've produced um, the guides that they have available on flammable refrigerants. And Steve also sits on various standards committees, for example, um, revising currently EN378 as well as one of the equivalent international standards. So we get heavily involved in industry-related things as well. So that's um, a little bit about us. Also, just giving you all a, a leaflet about us as well. If you want to book training, please do. That's the end of the sales pitch. Okay. Right, a little bit of history about hydrocarbons. What we're going to do is, is <coughs> sit for about um, 35, 40 minutes and then questions afterwards. The main driving force towards hydrocarbon is initially environmental um, and the reason for that is hydrocarbons have a very low GWP of 3 uh, compared to for example 404A which has a GWP of several thousand. So in the event of a leak, the direct effect of that leakage on climate change is about one thousandth or less than a thousandth of what it would be if it was a leak of HFC 404A. So you've got a very low direct impact. You've also got a lower indirect impact as well because uh, hydrocarbon systems tend to be more energy efficient. We've worked with a lot of manufacturers of hydrocarbon appliances, for example, they make an HFC range, they make a hydrocarbon range, they're measuring the energy consumption of both. The energy consumption of the hydrocarbon range is generally somewhere between 10 and 20% lower than it is doing the same job on HFCs. So you've got that energy efficiency benefit as well. You've also got good compatibility. Hydrocarbons are very good inside the system. They, they don't mix adversely with anything in there. They're compatible with the oils that we use, with the seal materials, gaskets, that sort of thing. And there's nothing new about using hydrocarbons. It was one of the first types of refrigerant used by the industry 150 years ago. The usage dropped off a lot in the 1930s because that's when we started using CFCs. But when we started to phase out the CFCs because of the ozone depletion potential, that's when we started to look at hydrocarbons again. Initially, we went back to using hydrocarbons in the domestic sector, um, mainly to start with in Europe, and all of our European produced domestic fridges and freezers are now on isobutane. 
uh, which is obviously a hydrocarbon, and there are about 500 million of them out there. And this isn't just confined to Europe. Other parts of the world use isobutane in their domestics as well. The big exception to that is the United States, but even there, they are starting to look at hydrocarbons in small systems. So that's the domestic sector. Of course, in the commercial sector, the usage, because of our larger charge sizes, is much more restricted. Um, but we are seeing hydrocarbons increasingly being used in integral type systems, so it could be display cabinets, um, commercial type fridges, for example. Roughly half of what Foster's make now is on hydrocarbon rather than HFC. Um, other um, types of integrals. Uh, chillers are also, that type of system also, um, lend themselves to hydrocarbons, um, where you're cooling water or glycol or something else, either for air conditioning or process cooling. We use hydrocarbons in conjunction with some of our CO2. Uh, so for example, it could be as the high stage refrigerant in a cascade, where your CO2 is your main low stage refrigerant. It could be cooling CO2 as a secondary fluid. Uh, that's, for example, what Marks and Spencers do. And some of their um, high stage systems are now on hydrocarbons. And then to a lesser extent, also, we see it in some of the split air conditioning systems there. But the maximum charge size is very restrictive on that type of application. Probably one of the most visible applications for hydrocarbons is these walls ice cream cabinets. Unilever decided to go 100% hydrocarbon as much as they could globally five or six years ago. So most of those are now that you see out there are now running on propane. So we're using various hydrocarbons as refrigerants. They do make extremely good refrigerants thermodynamically. They're probably better than a lot of the other refrigerants that we're talking about. But of course, we have to acknowledge the flammability does restrict where we can use them. Um, we are using three different hydrocarbons predominantly as refrigerants. Isobutane is what we're using in our domestics and some very small commercial systems as well. It's also known as R600A, so the R number of course is an internationally recognized designation system for refrigerants. A chemist will tell you that R600A is isobutane, as refrigeration engineers we have to learn that. And of course, we also have to know that that is isobutane and it's flammable. There's nothing in that designation that tells you that. It's also known by trade name from BOC and HRP. And it has a very high boiling point. Minus 12 degrees C at atmospheric pressure is a very high boiling point for a refrigerant. That has advantages and it has disadvantages. And we'll talk more about those later on. So that's what we're using in our domestics and some of our commercial. But what we use mostly in the commercial sector is either propane or propene. So propane is R290 and its boiling point at minus 42 is just a degree or two higher than it is with 404A. And then you've got propene, which is also known as propylene, and R1270, at minus 48, the boiling point is a few degrees lower than it is with 404A. So that just puts it into context. So looking at the flammability, I'm sure we're all familiar with the fuel triangle where you need a fuel, you need oxygen, and you need a source of ignition to actually get combustion. So our hydrocarbon refrigerant is potentially our fuel. The oxygen, of course, is in the air. You need to have that in the right mix for it to be potentially flammable. So a flammable mix would be somewhere between about 2 and 10% of hydrocarbon in air. And if you've got that right mix, then you can ignite that with anything hotter than 460 degrees C. That ignition temperature applies to the hydrocarbons we use as refrigerants. Some of the other hydrocarbons you'll ignite at lower temperatures than that. So a naked flame is obviously definitely a, a source of ignition, and there could well be enough energy in a spark also to be a source of ignition as well. That just uh, explains the flammable range. So what we're looking at here is no hydrocarbon in air there, 100% up here. So the lower flammability level is 2%, the upper flammability level is 10%. If you've got less than 2% in that region there, you physically haven't got enough fuel for combustion. And if you're in this region here, where you're above the 10%, you haven't got enough oxygen for combustion. So hydrocarbons have quite a narrow flammable range, but of course they have quite a low, low flammability level. And that's on a par with acetylene, for example. Acetylene has an LFL of about 2.6%. But of course acetylene can be flammable all the way up to 100%, so it has a much wider flammable range. So sources of ignition include naked flames, so a brazing torch, um, Hey, like leak lamp, match cigarette light, or anything like that would be a source of ignition most definitely. And then of course any unsealed electrical switch uh, where you've got contacts that can spark, so that could be a socket switch, a light switch, 
um, high pressure switches, uh, switches on vacuum pumps, recovery machines, all that type of thing would potentially be a source of ignition as well. So we have to consider all that when we're working with hydrocarbons and when we're designing the systems. Things that are not sources of ignition is anything that is EXN rated or an electrical <coughs> device that's been tested to that standard. Um, that EN60079 standard is harmonized with ATEX. ATEX is the Explosive Atmosphere Directive. Um, and anything designed to that standard can be safely used in a flammable atmosphere. So you will see on some hydrocarbon systems, for example, fan motors that have got an EXN rating on them, which means they are totally safe to be used in a flammable atmosphere. So even if that system is leaking flammable gas around that fan motor, it's always going to be quite safe. Um, or you might see that a device has got on it that has been tested to that particular standard. So that brings us on to looking at the standards and the regulations. There are a number of things that, that we consider. Um, ATEX, as I've said, is one of them. ATEX is the Explosive Atmosphere yes. European Directive. It's split into two. Um, ATEX 137 is what we comply with when we're working with any flammable gas in the workplace. So that, for example, could be uh, with brazing gases as well as hydrocarbon refrigerant. And ATEX, ATEX 95 covers the design of systems um, to go into a potentially flammable atmosphere. Now, you can argue and, and you can say, well, hang on a minute, we're talking about refrigeration systems here that are designed to contain a small amount of flammable gas. Why do they have to comply with ATEX? Well, of course, the answer is leakage. Um, the refrigerant potentially can leak out and therefore potentially can um, encompass that system in a flammable atmosphere, hence we have to comply with ATEX. One of the ways that we do that is to make sure that electrical devices are to this standard here, the EN60079 standard, because that is harmonized with ATEX. That standard also tells us how we do the simulated leak testing, for example. Another standard that we refer to is EN378, it's one that I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, and that covers things like maximum charge sizes, practical limits, training requirements, some of the procedures as well. In the UK, our Institute of Refrigeration has a code of practice on these flammable refrigerants. An A3 refrigerant is what the hydrocarbons fall under, and that means that they're highly flammable. The A means it's, it's very low toxicity. And the A2 refrigerants are the refrigerants that are not quite so flammable. So the mild using there are quite different to what we've used before in terms of the combination of the motor size and the displacement. Because we'd have the same size motor, uh, we just have to have twice the displacement. Um, because of that, we tend not to use that in the commercial sector. We tend to use R290 and R1270 because the cooling capacity is not identical to 404A, but very, very similar. So there's very little implication on compressor size if we go to 290 or 1270. So, R600A needs new compressors, but the others don't. Of course, that only gives you a rough idea. Any accurate comparison you need to take into account compressor technology, um, actual operating conditions and things like that. But then in addition to the cooling capacity, we also need to consider the energy consumption, and that will be somewhere between 10 and 20% less than it would be with an HFC doing the same job. Right, then we need to consider how we're going to make these systems safe, because we can't assume that the system is never going to leak the refrigerant charge. However well we make it, there is always going to be potential for leakage. So what we do is something called area classification, and that involves doing simulated leak tests. So what we're showing you here is an example of a simulated leak test. What we've got here is a cylinder of hydrocarbon. We're weighing it to know what the rate of, of leakage from that cylinder is. That's actually connected to this device here. And what that device has got in it is a very small hole that is sized in accordance with the standard. So we are leaking at a rate that is actually specified in the standard and it is a worst case scenario leak. And we've just placed that, that component next to a part of the system where you've got potential for leakage. So here, for example, you've got the joint going onto the filter dryer. So we're leaking refrigerant at a predetermined rate. And then what we need to do is wherever we've got sources of ignition, so we've got a control link just here, we actually need to sample the air to see what the concentration of hydrocarbon is around that source of ignition. So we've got a little tube that's pulling the air out of there, it's going back to this device here, that's giving us a very accurate readout of what the concentration of hydrocarbon is around that potential source of ignition there. If the concentration of hydrocarbon there is less than half of the LFL, then that's fine. 
even in the event of a worst case scenario leak, we know that that source of ignition will never actually ignite refrigerant because there will never be enough refrigerant there. If, on the other hand, the test work shows that we are above 50% of the lower flammability level, then we've got various options to make that system safe. One of the options is actually to move the electrics outside the flammable zone. We can do that because this testing has identified the extent of that flammable zone, so we know where we've got to move the electrics to make them safe. Or we can replace the electrics with these EXN rated devices. Or we can make sure there's always enough forced ventilation to disperse the refrigerant in the event of a leak. So for example, if you're considering a condensing unit where you've got an air cooled condenser with a fan on there, if you run that fan all the time, then you are pretty well always going to disperse the refrigerant safely. So some systems will have one or more of those uh, solutions to avoid the hazard in the event of a leak. You might find that you've got a condenser fan running all the time. You might find that an evaporator fan motor inside a glass door cabinet is an EXN rated fan motor. You might find that some of the electrical devices are to that standard or they're not in the place that they would normally be on an HMC system. So there are differences in the design to avoid the hazard associated with leakage. There are also very restrictive maximum charge sizes. And we have to consider two scenarios. We have to consider leakage that could occur on some systems into some sort of an enclosed occupied space. That could, for example, be from an evaporator into a cold room. It could be from an air conditioned, um, an indoor unit, an air conditioning system into a room like this. It could be that, if, for example, you've got an ice maker in a prep room in a supermarket, and you've got to consider the size of the prep room. So wherever we can leak into some sort of enclosed occupied space, we then have to look at maximum charge sizes. This leakage at or close to the system, that has been sorted by doing that simulated leak testing and looking at the electrical devices on the system. So we need to go back to the LFL. Um, earlier on, we said that the LFL was 2% of hydrocarbon in air. That's actually not terribly informative. It doesn't really give you a feel for how much we mean. That is equivalent to a concentration of hydrocarbon in the air of 0 0.04 kilograms of hydrocarbon per cubic meter, which of course is the same as 40 grams of hydrocarbon per cubic meter. So in other words, if you've got an enclosure that's a one meter by one meter by one meter, and you charge 40 grams of hydrocarbon into that, you will just be at the lower flammability level there. So you will be able to ignite that. And that is obviously what we're trying to avoid with the addition of the safety margin. And just to put that into context, 40 grams of hydrocarbon is probably less than you've got in two disposable cigarette lighters. They've probably got about 25 grams in each. So that's less than two disposable cigarette lighters worth. So the charge is limited by the practical limit for refrigeration systems, and that practical limit is in EN378, and it is for all the hydrocarbons, 8 grams per cubic meter, or 0 0.008 kilograms per cubic meter. You will notice that that is actually 20% or one fifth of the actual lower flammability, I'm sorry, of the LFL, the lower flammability level. And that gives us a safety margin, and it takes into account the fact that, of course, if we do get a leak of hydrocarbon, the hydrocarbon's heavier than air, most of it, or some of it, will be down there, and there'll be a greater concentration at low level. So we have to take that into account, and that's why we build in this safety margin of 20%. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. And we also have limits that have worked out slightly differently if the application is comfort cooling or heating. So there's a, an equation that works that out, and I'll show you that as well. And in addition to that, there are absolute maximum charge sizes that we must never exceed. And whichever one of these comes out lowest, that's the one that we have to comply with. So the first thing to say about all that is that when you have systems with less than 150 grams of hydrocarbon in, they can go anywhere. There's no restriction on where they go. Um, the logic behind that is they're going to be factory-produced systems, they're going to be hermetic systems, leakage is going to be very small if it does occur, and that refrigerant will be safely dispersed. And if you do have a leak, you're never going to get the 150 grams out anywhere. A lot of it just stays stuck in compressor oil. So those systems can go anywhere. When we go above 150 grams, then we need to start looking at maximum charge size. So these are the absolute maximums that we can't um, exceed, and they depend on the area um, and the location. So the first thing is 
any part of your system is below ground, then you are limited to one kilogram charge. That is per individual system. So you could have equipment below ground, and you could have 10 systems below ground. As long as individually each one doesn't exceed one kilogram, then that's fine. That's within the standard. Then when you go to ground level and above, the um, occupancy is split into three. Category A is, is public areas and areas where people are restricted in movement or sleeping. Um, so it's, it's hotels, it's prisons, hospitals, lecture theatres, cinemas, big supermarkets, that sort of thing. There you are limited to one and a half kilograms per individual system. Again, a supermarket can decide that they want to use hydrocarbons in their retail refrigeration systems, obviously not in a central plant system, which are well exceeding the 1.5 kilos, but you can certainly do it in integrals, so long as individually, each individual circuit contains no more than one and a half kilograms. And that is being done, actually, in the UK, and we'll talk about one of those examples later on. <coughs> Category B is where you've got fewer people. They tend to be commercial premises, so you can have up to two and a half kilograms. And Category C is authorised access only, and you can have up to 10 kilos. And these are di DX systems, direct expansion systems. Um, what we've done is we've just tried to, to put on the, the overhead the most common restrictions. There are others as well. There's a, quite a large table in the N378 that we've sort of distilled this from. Um, so for example, if you had a chiller system, so you had an indirect system rather than DX, if that chiller's outside in a category C authorized access area, and there's no way that the hydrocarbon can make its way via the fluid into a public area, the amount of hydrocarbon you can have in that chiller is actually unlimited. So we can have very big hydrocarbon systems as well as the smaller ones that we're more used to seeing. This is an example of how we apply the practical limit. So that practical limit for the hydrocarbons is 0.008 kilograms per cubic meter. And all we do is we just multiply that by the volume of the enclosed space. So this is an example for a walking cauldron. We've got the dimensions of the cauldron there. You just multiply them together to give you volume. You multiply that volume by the practical limit, and that gives you the maximum charge. And if that, that is the amount, maximum amount of refrigerant that you can charge into an individual system where it could potentially leak into that volume. And you can see that's very restrictive. You are not going to be able to cool that cauldron with that amount of refrigerant unless it's in something like a monoblock type system. You can't do it with a condensing unit that's remote from the um, evaporator, for example, simply because of the amount of refrigerant you'd have in there. So where we are using hydrocarbons on cauldrons, cold stores, it's being done with small monoblock and possibly multiples of those small monoblock type systems. Now, when we come on to comfort cooling or heating, we don't just multiply the volume by the practical limit, we use this lovely equation. So, M is the maximum charge, LFL is the lower flammability level, H is the height of the indoor unit, and A is the floor area. And just to give you an example of that, this is actually for our training room. If we wanted to use propane, that's its LFL, that's the height for an ceiling mounted indoor unit, that's our floor area. Plugging all those numbers into the equation tells us that our maximum charge would be just under 650 grams of hydrocarbon. Again, that is obviously very restrictive. Uh, we're talking about a room that's a little bit bigger than this. Um, so you would not be able to cool that room using one system with that small amount of refrigerant. You would have to split the cooling up into smaller units or use another refrigerant. Just a little bit about retrofit. You can see from what we've said about um, designing systems so that they're safe to work on hydrocarbons, maximum charge size, etc., that hydrocarbons do not lend themselves to retrofitting um, R22 systems, for example, or anything else. Um, only put hydrocarbons into systems that are specifically designed for them. We would never recommend that you retrofit. Right, just want to say a little bit now about, about <coughs> working safely with hydrocarbons. The PPE that, that the engineers would wear would be exactly the same as other refrigerants, gloves and goggles, but in addition to that, um, we strongly recommend that they have a hydrocarbon monitor. And what that does is it sits at low level in the work area, it's continually monitoring the air, so if you're doing invasive work on the system, you have that going. That tells you whether or not you've got a concentration of hydrocarbon building up in the air, it gives you an alarm, both visually and audibly. And it's telling you, for example, whether or not it's safe for you to light a brazing torch if you're going to unbraze connections onto the system to change a compressor. Systems of ignition on them, like on-off switches, 
um, HPLP switches, relays, etc., that make them unsafe to work with hydrocarbons. So there is one available um, that's actually being exported all over the world because it seems to be the only one available, um, and that's made in the south of England, and it's called a care saver. And then, of course, the other piece of equipment that you need is the leak monitor, the hydrocarbon monitor that we've already talked about. If we just quickly go through the service procedures, um, leak detection, the, the procedure, of course, is, is identical to any other system working methodically around the system, etc. The method needs to be safe and sensitive, so soapy water or the right electronic leak detector. For refrigerant recovery, you need that correct recovery machine. And you also need to be aware that when you're filling recovery cylinders, hydrocarbons are much less dense than HFCs, so you need to work out what the safe fill weight is for the cylinder if it's not correctly already marked for hydrocarbon. To get the refrigerant out of the system, we are actually allowed to vent in the UK. Um, the Environment Agency allows us to vent less than 150 grams, so long as we vent it to outside to a safe area. If the charge size is more than that, or if we can't safely vent, then we do have to recover it as normal. Probably one of the most hazardous things that anybody does on a hydrocarbon system is unbrazing. So there are very clear procedures on how you do that safely. They basically, it involves removing the refrigerant from the system down onto a vacuum and then backfilling the system with nitrogen so that as you unbraze, you're not going to get air going into the system, but you've diluted any remaining hydrocarbon in there with the nitrogen, so you're not going to get a massive flame if you do that. The vacuum pump that you use, the switch on the vacuum pump is a source of ignition. So we don't use it, we just have that on all the time. We plug our vacuum pump into a long extension lead and we plug that in outside of our three meter zone. When we're charging the systems because of the lower density, the charge weight is less, so we have to be really careful how accurately we charge systems, so that's a bit, that's a challenge. And then when we're replacing components, it's important that we replace like for like on the electrical components because a lot of them are different to standard. Right, a little bit about the training and qualifications. Uh, we've been running this half-day session um, since the middle of the 90s. We've got several thousand engineers through that. It is a theory-only session. But it started off because um, when Caligas launched the hydrocarbons into the UK market, they made it a sales policy that restricted sales of the hydrocarbon refrigerant to engineers who had attended the session. And that has been carried on by BOC when they bought the business as well. So. That's one of the reasons for doing that, but obviously it's also sensible that anybody working on a refrigerant they're not familiar with has the appropriate training. Last year we worked with City and Guilds and developed the 6187 pathway unit on hydrocarbons. So although the City and Guilds 6187 is quite a large um, qualification scheme, there are a number of standalone units within that. And one of those is on hydrocarbons. There's also one on CO2, there'll be one on brazing as well. Um, and just out of interest, McDonald's, for example, has specified that engineers working on their site, now this is available, they have that City and Guilds qualification. And it includes a practical assessment as well as a theory assessment. So that's just a little bit more about it, the 6187 qualification. On the practical side, an engineer needs to work all the way through making sure that the work area is safe, that everything necessary is there, like the hydrocarbon monitor. And um, basically what the engineer is going to do in the <coughs> assessment is actually replace a component on the system by unbrazing and then rebrazing. So that means going through all the important procedures for recovery, evacuation, backfilling with nitrogen, um, unbrazing, brazing, etc., and then doing the pressure test, charging, and loop testing. So all of that is included in that practical assessment. Right, I'll just finish off by, because I'm being flashed five minutes here, about six minutes ago, I think. Um, I'm just going to finish off by talking about one example. And it just shows you what you can do with hydrocarbons. Um, and actually, by having to work with a flammable gas, this has actually almost solved our leakage problems with refrigerants. What Waitrose are doing in the UK is, with their new stores and their major refits, going 100% hydrocarbon where it's safe to do. So 99% of these new systems are hydrocarbon. Now, obviously, that's not in a central plant system. They've got integral cabinets on the shop floor, but the integrals, rather than having a conventional air-cooled condensing unit on, have water-cooled condensing units, and that avoids the heat and the noise going down onto the shop floor. Um, so you've got little condensing units on here. You've obviously got water being circulated around the shop floor, 
That water is chilled down to about 16 degrees C. It returns back to the chillers outside at about 24 degrees C. So it's not that cold. Um, one of the reasons for that is that we can take advantage of free cooling for a lot of the year to get it down to 16 degrees C. Uh, and don't forget, it is not being used directly to cool these cabinets. It's being used to remove the heat from the water cool condensers here. So you've got about 800 grams per individual system here. You've got about 7.5 kilograms per individual circuit in the chillers. You've got some pumping, obviously. You've got some heat reclaim as well. That's a schematic of the condensing unit on the integrals. Horizontal scroll compressor discharges into a de-superheater. That just takes some of the heat out of the refrigerant and ducks it down into the aisles um, so that you don't get chilly aisles. You've got a fan on there that's running all the time, so that disperses any refrigerant if it does leak from that condensing unit. You come, the superheated refrigerant comes out of there. This is a small plate heat exchanger, which is the water cooled condenser, so you've got water in and out of there as well. And then the condensed refrigerant is coming out of there through the filter dryer and down through the expansion valve, evaporation back up to the scroll compressor. So you've got about 800 grams in each one of those of propene, actually, propylene. The chillers are fairly standard chillers. One of the main differences is there is gas detection in the housing. Uh, so that's an example there. And what that does is if it does sense a leak of hydrocarbon refrigerant into that chiller, it just switches on ventilation fans and isolates the electrics to make it safe. Um, so that's dispersing the refrigerant and making it safe for the chiller. Most of these chillers are outside on the roof. Where they are in underground plant rooms, of course, that means they can't use hydrocarbons, so they're using 407C instead. That's an example of the water pumps and the venting. Uh, so this is the flow out of the chiller down onto the shop floor. There's a vent on there because if you do get a leak of hydrocarbon refrigerant in there, you don't want to take it down onto the shop floor, so it's just vented out through the increased pressure. That's an example of the split air conditioning because the air conditioning is also on hydrocarbons. Um, so those are models uh, which are based on our R407C models, but they have been modified in the factory to make them safe to run with hydrocarbons. The electrics have moved slightly different place, for example. And of course, a lot of areas will have multiple splits to get below the maximum charge size. That's an example of the cauldron um, monoblock type units. Again, because of charge size restriction, that is the type of refrigeration system that's being used there. Um, just a little bit about leakage from these systems. As we know, a conventional supermarket running on HFC <laughs> will have several hundred kilograms of HFC and will leak 20 to 30 percent of the charge a year. That is not unusual. Um, these systems have less than 100 kilograms of hydrocarbon total in the store and they leak maybe one or two kilograms a year. So, you know, we talk about trying to reduce leakage because we're having to use a flammable refrigerant and therefore we are using different, it differently. We're using it in factory produced smaller systems. We have, as a byproduct, sold almost solved the leakage problem as well. Right, having said that, I'm just going to end on that. I just want to say, a, sorry, okay. given the look here, um, I just want to say a little bit about R32, <coughs> because R32 is a flammable HFC, and I noticed that it's not actually covered in anything else I don't think that you've had talks on. Um, so it's not a hydrocarbon, it is an HFC, but it is flammable. It's actually difluoromethane. It's being used by Dakin and Mitsubishi in some of their split air conditioning systems. And it is very similar in performance to 410A. And we already use it as a component in 410A and 406C. <coughs> but when it's mixed with the other components, you end up with a non-flammable blend. But when it's used on its own, it is mildly flammable. So this compares it with propane, R290, and 410A. So the boiling point is very similar to 410A. It is classed as an A2 refrigerant, which means that it's mildly flammable, it's not highly flammable like the hydrocarbons, but it's not non-flammable like 410A. So that is because the lower flammability level is a lot higher, you need a lot more of it to get to the uh, a flammable region, therefore the practical limit is a lot higher, therefore you can use a lot more of it, the maximum charge size is a lot greater than it would be with a hydrocarbon, so it lends itself quite nicely to split air conditioning system applications. But the downside is the GWP is not as low as the hydrocarbons, but it's not as high as 410A. So it's a bit of a compromise on the way through. But we are starting to see it being used in, in air conditioning systems, so you will see it 
at some stage if you haven't already. Right, just a quick summary then. We are using hydrocarbons in a very wide range of applications now. As training providers, we've seen step changes in the use of hydrocarbons. For example, when you believe we used it, started to use it in their ice cream cabinets and then when Waitrose started to use it in their supermarkets and a lot of other applications as well. Our experience is good. Um, we've had no major incidences um, from the point of view of performance and reliability. We have a very good refrigerant there as well. And we've got standards and regulations in place that guide us how to use it safely. And that is, is probably why we are using it in the way that we are and we haven't had major accidents. We are complying with the standards and the standards are there to make sure that we are working safely with the refrigerants. If you need more information, obviously we can provide it. The British Refrigeration Association can as well. The UK Institute of Refrigeration, especially the service engineer section, has a number of guidance uh, <coughs> notes on hydrocarbons. And then your national standards authority has uh, obviously all the relevant standards as well. Okay, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, just to wrap up, well, firstly, before we do, has anyone got any questions for Jane? Can I, sorry, excuse me, can I just ask you about the uh, uh, the hurdle, if you like, of getting uh, a flammable refrigerant into, like, like Waitrose there, for instance, mm -hmm. like, we sell mainly ammonia systems, and I presume it's a familiar debate, but was there much opposition to bringing flammable refrigerants into a system like, like a large supermarket? Um, and, how no, were, how were they, how, and more interestingly, how were they overcome if there were? I mean, they work yeah. very closely with consultants on, mm. on to make sure they're complying with the standards. But the point really is that now the standards are in place that guide you on how to use hydrocarbons safely or any flammable mm. refrigerant safely. And so long as you're in compliance with those standards, it does mean that you have to design systems very differently, of course. Mm. But um, the, the standards are there to help us do that safely. So because of that, the, the opposition really was, I don't think, which has had any major opposition but to... As an end user, yeah. they dictated mm. that's what they were going to do. So the contractors either got on board with it mm. or they didn't. That was it. So it's very different <coughs> from, from a contractor taking a concept to an end user yeah. Um, where you have to convince them that this yeah, might be yeah. a good idea to put flammable gas all throughout their supermarket mm -hmm. and all the normal fear that will come with that. Um, when the end user actually determines it, it tends to invert the issue. It's not an issue because the end user dictates that's what's going to happen. As you could say the same with carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. okay, there's plenty of resistance to it within the contractor base, but the end user has determined they're going to do that. And if they don't do it, they will be out of business. Now, with regards to the actual standards, the standards were in place well before they ever had the idea of putting it into a supermarket. So 378, although we don't relate it always in, in terms of, of where do we get the standards from to, to put in place hydrocarbons, everything that we do with hydrocarbons was already in the standards from, from, from 2008 onwards. So there were, there were no uh, standards issues with, with doing it, just interpretation of the standards as there always is with, with, with British standards, EN standards. So. Um, we were well placed at the point we did it to do it. Um, there wasn't really any major issues or hurdles or obstacles to overcome. Um, with that particular client, yeah. With, with the client or, yeah. or with any of the standards authorities or, or yeah. people such as the fire service, etc. Mm. They, they were all quite happy with what we were doing. So you've taken um, a, a standard and actually applied it. Whereas, of course, when we install a 404A supermarket, we don't apply the standards. Um, and because we don't apply the standards, because it's an A1 and it doesn't kill anybody, just kills the environment dead, we don't worry so much. The, the benefit of the hydrocarbon was, because everyone was so terrified we were going to blow a supermarket up, we actually religiously followed the standards. So the message there is, if you religiously follow the standards, actually most systems would be a safe and wouldn't leak. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the interesting thing that's come out of this. Um, it's not been a success story because hydrocarbons were any different. It's been a success story because we actually followed the standards. When we install carbon dioxide supermarkets, we don't follow the standards. Consequently, they're going wrong. 
but we don't have to worry about carbon dioxide because it's not going to blow the supermarket up. So it's an interesting thing. It's, it's perception of the risk. So the actual very problem of flammability has actually been the reason it's worked. So we should make ammonia more dangerous. If we made all of the <laughs> really dangerous, we would have less problems with refrigeration <coughs> systems. Yeah. We just take the chiller units on the roof there, mm -hmm. for instance. I noticed that they were in an open area, etc., mm -hmm. etc., but they're still less than 10 kilogram charge yeah. per circuit there. Yeah. What kind of capacity were, were they, do you, can you recall? Um, they, they're um, typically, because they're multiples yeah. of 7.5 um, kilograms, so, so we're into 250, 260, 300 kilowatt chillers. So an ammonia unit would have gone in there and potentially less dangerous than, than the, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But then you have to look at the mm. serviceability of those chillers within the retail commercial yeah, sector yeah, and, the, yeah, and, the, and, yeah. the, and the pool of engineers that you have to look after those sites. Mm. Um, Okay. So, 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 and they weren't limited at um, they weren't limited at um, at seven and a half kilos for any for mm. any standards reason. Mm. That was purely an emotional limitation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so it, it was purely that you know we, we can have a seven and a half kilo canister on a, on a barbecue, but, mm. but if we have more than that in a water chiller, all of a sudden it's going to become yeah. quite dangerous. So, for, so there was a, there was an irrational logic to why there's a, there's part part of the stuff we haven't got up there. Uh, part, part, one of the occupancies limits of ten kilograms. Mm. Okay, for 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 certain applications. So we, they clamped onto 10 kilograms for the water chillers. Okay. Okay. And they achieved reasonably within minimum numbers of circuits the amount of capacity they needed at 10 kilos. So, so okay. it became an urban myth, and that's what we went with. Okay. Thanks. Does that help? Yeah. Ian, just the, how does the capital cost and the running cost of that retro system compare with a more traditional system of the up Ma that magic you words. Know that's, that's always really very difficult to get hold of, but they use this lovely term cost neutral. That means that if I come to you and say we want to install a carbon dioxide supermarket, you will install it for the same cost as a 404A supermarket, you as a contractor would say, okay and we do the same with hydrocarbons as well. So whether it was or wasn't cost neutral, that was what was imposed on the contractor. Okay, the We will put it in as cost neutral. Energy-wise, it's going to be roughly like for like, because you're not running a pack of scrolls or recips or screws that you can wind down on part load Okay, for a large portion portion of the year. You're running individual <coughs> scrolls per cabinet, which if the cabinet wants to run, it has to run the compressor. It can't, it can't work on a diversity of a part load. Um, conversely, you're getting something in terms of energy because of the fluid, and you're getting something because of compression ratio in terms that we're condensing at a much lower and a much more constant condition on the shop floor because it's water. Okay, and we're getting free cooling out of the water chiller. So in answer to all of that, it's probably going to be on a par, maybe a little bit better than a 404A equivalent. All right, but we're also doing a lot more stuff with heat reclaim, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it is also fair to say we don't run 404A supermarkets efficiently or effectively. We throw them in, we don't really commission them, they leak all over the place, and we don't go back to them for year after year. So if you were actually to commission and look after a 404A supermarket properly, it would probably be as good as our hydrocarbon. But the official line is it's on a par and it's cost neutral. The, what are the interest? What condensing temperature are you running the, the small units at? Condensing what? Well, the water temperature is about 16, yeah. so they're probably condensing just over 20. Yeah. yeah. Of what pressure? On. Um, like we know that off the top of our head, which we should, but we, <laughs> we don't. Should. We're condensing at about 20 degrees, I can't tell. Um, so it would be yeah. about 15 bar. Yeah. It, 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 so it's not to, high, definitely not you've high. Got, you've, you've got benefits there in. in and also, because. You know, the, the, we haven't had the long term yet. That, those compressors are working like a domestic compressor. They're working in a relatively constant. Regardless of ambient, it's a constant. So you're not getting compressor failures at the same rate as you might with normal air-cooled integral stuff inside the supermarket where the ambient go, is going to go up and down, etc. It's a relatively constant environment. And is there a limit on the temperature range in those cabinets? I mean, it, it, it's, Meat, dirty sort of temperatures. All normal temperatures. We're running, we're running ice cream cabinets down to minus 25, frozen food down so to minus 22. Down circuit on all of them then, are they it's just an on-off circuit. It's just a, it, it's a glorified integral. It's yeah. just a capillary integral with a, with a water-cooled condenser. That's it. There, there will be, in some cases, a liquid solenoid to stop migration into the evaporator, but it's on-off control. And it's just a glorified integral cabinet. And that's one of the benefits, you see. 
that they've had. They are they look like commercial. They are commercial cabinets. So they're multiplex cabinets. It, it looks. If you walk around, you have to look very hard to see that it was a water cooled site. They're just standard cabinets in terms of the what, what we develop. But you roll onto the shop floor with pre commissioned pre charged, ready to run cabinets. Two forty volt up them. Flow return. Turn on. Walk away. That's it. Then that's another benefit to, to the install process. That actually they don't have a refrigeration contractor engaged at the installation stage. They have a plumber and an electrician and case fitters. That's it. Because effectively the installation's been done at the factory. Yeah. And the commissioning's been done at the factory. Could that um, system be applied then to uh, non hydrocarbon refrigerants? Oh yes, the it, first one they did was, was on 404A, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, the first one was on yeah. 404A. To prove the, 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 the model, uh, without the risk of blowing the building up, they, they went for 404A to prove it. But the benefit of the hydrocarbon is, is the better energy efficiency. Yeah. So that's, and also the, the green bling bit too. Um, Jane, do you think any of the other, with, 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 with the six retail groups in the UK driving so much of what happens in the, uh, on the retail side of refrigeration, do you think any of the other groups will move to hydrocarbons? Well, I can tell you that Tesco are installing high, the Waitrose type system in Thailand. So they're doing that there, for example. The co op are also looking at, uh, I think they're also installing that system, aren't they? The mm. Waitrose type system. But no, the other retailers are pretty well with CO2 <coughs> in the UK. So coming yes, back a stage on that, the, the, you've got you have got hydrocarbon cabinets in every end user in terms of integrals, okay? But in terms of the mainstream plant, the majority have got